when you think about it, I did not want to make this video this early into my career due to the fact that this kind of art challenge brings with it certain expectations. I think you know what I mean. And because of YouTube, certain liberties like nudity, body proportions, and story cliches had to be weighed carefully. So to temper expectations, let me start by saying what you will get and what you won't get. What you will get is me attempting to do something outside my comfort zone, with varying results. You will see some nudity, but not the kind you were expecting. The characters are older, so most of them more or less are in their early 30s and above. No high schoolers here. You will get some video capture of the process, but not the entire process for reasons you will come to understand. This video is both an entertainment piece and an educational tool, should you decide to do the same in the future. I wouldn't recommend it, but that's up to you to decide. Now, what you won't get is pretty simple. Anything that could get me on a watch list will be excluded. And sadly, no explicit sexy stuff this time. I do not want to walk outside my door and have several hitmen waiting for me like I'm John Wick. I assure you, my ground game is garbage, and just about anyone could put me into a submission hold without trying. Maybe if I have enough demand here and on Patreon, I'll consider doing some other types of manga-related art challenges in the future. Maybe even the sexy stuff, who knows. That all said, let's get moving, huh? In the beginning, me and Japanese media have a complicated history. Starting with the first broadcast of Toonami on Cartoon Network in the 90s, to say I was an admirer from afar is an understatement. I was a closeted weeb, you can say. During the peak of my weaving, I took a standard composition notebook and tried to make my own style guide for anime art styles like Naruto and Bleach. I would spend an hour dissecting episodes, trying to replicate the same construction lines I saw on the TV, and translate them into this cheap notebook. I would later destroy said notebook. Why would I do this? Well, that's a topic for another video. What matters now is I never stopped admiring this art form, specifically the comics. Let's skip forward to 2023. On June 30th, the Silent Manga Audition announced on their Instagram page another round for their annual contest. The rules are simple. 17 pages or less to be read right to left instead of left to right. And no dialogue. There are other technicalities, some obvious ones like no sex, violence, yada yada yada, you get the picture. The other smaller details deal with exporting. The file size, resolution, page order, and proper labeling. Remember this because it will come up again later. The contest is open to all, all countries, all backgrounds. If you follow the rules and produce an original work by the deadline, you're golden. There are prizes, of course, but the one that sticks out to me is the opportunity to prove your mettle as a storyteller and an artist. I heard about this through YouTube. Special thanks to these guys for the inspiration. At that exact moment, an idea crept into my mind. What if I made a manga? Then, I shuddered at the mere thought. The fact is, Thanks to these other YouTubers and the death of several mangaka, I'm acutely aware that this is not easy. In fact, it's bordering on lunacy, especially with the deadline being December 4th. I heard about this in mid-July. That means I only got six months to make this happen. Barring other roadblocks like odd jobs and dating, there's my current output to consider. It takes me two days a week 
barely to create a three-page comic, totaling about nine hours to complete. That's not great, but that's all I can do presently. So let's just say either I give up activities to open up more time, basically give up my life, or I don't bother trying. And did I mention I wasn't being paid? As you can see, it's not a good idea. If you need any more reasons for not to join this contest, here's a visual for you up on the screen. But you know what? I am not afraid of dying anymore. So let's get crazy. So here are the rules of this challenge. Number one, create an original story. Number two, use a manga style or as close to one as possible. Number three, the files must be a JPEG or PNG type with a resolution of 300 DPI with a size of 2 megabytes or less. Number four, follow the other rules listed on the Silent Manga Audition rules page, yada, 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 but read it thoroughly. And finally, number five, meet the deadline of December 4th. In this case, November 30th, because I don't trust myself. Here are the tools used. If you don't have Clip Studio or a drawing tablet, rest assured you can do all of this challenge with just paper and pens. If you have access to a scanner at your local library or phone camera, that's more than enough. Remember, there's always a workaround. Just be ready to do the work. Before we start, we need to prepare. Benjamin Franklin once said, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Much like surgery, I'm that surgeon who just showed up with no knowledge of the art of cutting people open and decided to go, I'll figure it out eventually. Let's do this. Consequently, all my projects would die on the operating table because I didn't do my homework. So for week one, before picking up any stylus, I decided to sit down and reflect, assessing my resources, skill level, and art process. Here's the situation. We have the tools. We have reference books. But no time. Six months and counting. And I'm incredibly slow. Every second counts here. So if I remember my business operations professor, how you make something is as important as the final product. In other words, understand the process and tweak it for the sake of time. So here we look at my to-do list. We have to write the story, do character designs, followed by storyboard, rough out the page, inking, then final edit, export it, and finally create the profile and submit it. In total, that's eight tasks to do. Looking at each task, let me single out any I feel will take longer than 30 minutes to do. The time consuming task will be largely editing and exporting each page, followed by panel design, inking, and page roughs. The simplest task will be writing, storyboarding, and uploading the files to the SMA entry website. From this knowledge, I can decide which of these tasks I can add or subtract from the process. Now, the obvious choice in your mind would be to subtract tasks from my to-do list. Less task means less time wasted, right? Some options include making the character design simple, make the story short and sweet, and make the page count as low as possible. So instead of submitting 17 pages, you submit eight pages worth of story. No matter how mediocre the end product is, as long as I show the theme of memorable smiles somewhere, I meet the contest requirements. However, cutting the art is the first choice in any business decision. From movie productions to your school's decision to cut the art department's budget. This logic makes sense for a business person. But I am not a businessman. I am a madman with a death wish. So no change to the art aspect. 
thus the page count will remain 17 pages exactly. This will be enough to tell some kind of meaningful story. The character designs will also be unaffected. So much so, I will incorporate some kind of complexity like asymmetry or annoying accessories to redraw. Note, I will use some cartoon exaggerations here and there, going off model in non-critical story beats, but going back to the signature style during the more serious moments. So how am I going to save time if I'm not going to eliminate certain steps from my to-do list? The answer is that I'm going to add steps. Wait, what? Let me explain using Aesop's tale of the tortoise and hare. There's more than one way to complete a task. If you're pursuing a speed strategy much like the hare, you will cut corners wherever you can, just to get to the finish line first. The only problem is you tend to get sloppy. You make mistakes easily and more frequently, overlooking small details that are actually a big deal. Eventually, without control or discipline, those mistakes add up and may disqualify you from the race. This is a race that you can't afford to overlook the slightest detail. So the best course of action is quality. Quality is slow and patient but methodical, considering any obstacle you may encounter and eliminate it before you reach it. Though you may feel like the world's slowest tortoise, you will reach the same destination. What this entails goes like this. Instead of penciling everything digitally like I usually do, I'm going to pencil it on paper first, adding time to the existing rough page stage because every stroke matters, seeing as there's no undo button in real life, which also adds the extra step of scanning each page. Next, I'll add the steps of preparing the file, creating the panels, and organizing my layers. Let's call this the setup. Four extra steps in total. How, you may ask, could this save me time if I'm making myself do more work? <sighs> well, historically, I'd make a page digitally, right? Then, I would not like it. Then erase it and try again. I'd start at 6 p.m. and then still have nothing to show for myself by 2 a.m. Not to mention, I'd be really into a detailed illustration, only to make a mistake and find out I've been drawing on the wrong layer this whole time, making it virtually impossible to fix the mistake without undoing four hours of work. If I made a killer art cover and need to find the coloring layer, I can't because every layer is mislabeled and I can't exactly navigate through an ocean of unmarked layers without going mad. But, but, assuming everything goes right, I go to send the file off to the printers only to find out that the file was too small or too big or in the wrong order. But if I try to resize it and hit save, whoops, I damage the original file and thus 40 hours of work is all for naught. Because there was no backup file to save me. In essence, these extra steps are there to ensure the time cost I had experienced in the past won't happen again. Or to put it simply, do it right once and never worry about it again. By reducing the time wasted on administrative work, let's consider the art style. Here's mine. It's a bit cartoony. Now, here's examples of manga styles done by other artists. See the difference? How can I take this and turn it into this? How do I develop a new style? The answer lies in reading. And reading a lot. For the next few months, every night before bed, and every morning in the shower, I'd read up on a different series. I notice how every artist interprets panel design, counting the number of panels they used and how they compose a page to be read, aka reading flow. Then I reread the page and notice how things like clothes, anatomy, backgrounds, and expressions are handled, 
A style is just how an artist interprets reality. A style is also a collection of successes and mistakes. Some artists are better at drawing hands than others. Others are great at dynamic poses. But draftsmanship is only a piece of what makes comics special. The story they try to convey is the other piece. Many stories have made me sad or happy with simple if not crude designs used to tell great stories effectively. Others bored me despite their high production value. Consequently, all this reading helped me consider character design and panel layout, or the way the story is presented. If this topic interests you, Naoki Orasawa-san's YouTube channel is a good resource for this. Check him out. Additional supplementary resources included me watching manga-inspired illustrations on YouTube. Watching these time lapses helped me understand the process and motivated me to do the same in my own interpretation of the style. If I wasn't drawing, I would spend two hours related to the thing I was making for the next six months. I even studied as I was putting pen to paper to this comic. The style just emerged, you can say. Before we move on from prep to the next segment, let me confess something first so you don't think I'm some genius. I kind of cheated, or to be more specific, I was actually drawing manga inspired artwork in secret and didn't tell anyone before I even heard about this contest. It started out of curiosity. Could I actually do it? It kind of dawned on me that I want to try something new. So I drew this during my spare time without any timer running in the background. This would be my first manga-inspired illustration, partially fueled by my love for mechs and science fiction. What followed was more experiments that I posted on an undisclosed website. As you can see, these were more than just illustrations, but attempts to tell a story. It's self-evident in the mini-sketches attached to each artwork. Thus. This little practice would help me in the art department, but what about the story department? Creating an original story is a science. Creating a story that will be read in Japan and later worldwide is rocket science. I'm an American, attempting to tell a story to readers who may not speak my language. Certain customs and body language may be lost to them. How do I communicate something that they can relate to? How do you take something someone has seen before and present it in a new way? I considered questions like that, but I can't think when I'm sitting still, so I usually go on long, arduous walks. Twice a day, rain or shine, I use that time to work out things in my head. And after maybe four or five walks, I worked out the following. This is going to be a romantic comedy. If we're talking about genre, probably a shoujo manga. The setting will be a modern fantasy, not too dissimilar to what Mike Mignola does with his Hellboy series setting. The entire story for this one shot is a fetch quest, featuring three characters, at least two of them will be explicitly after a MacGuffin. But much like stories written by Rumiko Takihashi-san, nothing goes as planned for the hero or villain leading to opportunities to entertain the reader as they are the real winners in all this. To do so, I have to use her approach to storytelling, by giving the characters small personal stakes and flipping the reader's expectations. It also helps to focus on the hero and villain of the story and make them flawed somehow. The further I walked, the closer I came to an answer, starting with the hero. I decided the protagonist needed to be a greedy monk, a mercenary for hire who takes care of bizarre cases pertaining to the supernatural. An exorcist, you can say. A bounty hunter for fairy tales on the other. At his core, a professional. In reality, he's an amateur. Who somehow gets the job done due to grit and dumb luck. He's dirty, smelly, and willing to do anything for a stack of cash. Why he needs all this money, and where he came from will remain vague for the sake of the one-shot. Oh, and he's got a pretty face. The antagonist must contrast with the hero. 
So if the protagonist is a handsome vagabond with feminine qualities, but a bad personality, the opposite must be true for the villain. Let's make him a malformed troll. Despite his appearance, he's a gentleman with a great love of finer things in life. You could say he's a collector. He also loves cats and is fearful of canaries. Then, a eureka moment presented itself. The MacGuffin is an expensive ragdoll cat. From there, the rest of the story presented itself before me. The protagonist was hired by a wealthy benefactor to find her missing cat. It was stolen by the antagonist one night, and the owner fears that the monster will eat her precious child if nothing is done. But, surprisingly, the stolen cat loves her captor more than her original owner, and doesn't want to leave him. Now here I see the conflict and motivations. The monk wants the cat because it will bring him riches. The troll wants the cat not to eat, but to cherish it in a way the cat deserves adding her to his collection of exotic cats. Among his collected is the third character. I decided to make the female lead a supernatural creature. Her role will most lead to challenge both hero and villain as a supporting character. The female character, if anything, will push him in the direction he truly needs to be rather than where he wants to be. Rereading this, did I just describe a manic pixie dream girl? Thus a new story develops with her inclusion. She's a man-eater. No, literally, a giant cat demon who eats people. She was captured somehow by the troll to add to his collection. And, by chance, was released by the hero to run amok. She was planning on eating him, but had a change of heart at the last second. But like most cats, she hates the people that want her and approaches those that don't. I must confess I was inspired by a video of a cat snuggling with its owner as he sleeps, so I decided to also add a scene where this happened to the protagonist. To make it interesting, let's establish that the hero really hates cats and is not enjoying the prospect of being snuggled by a deadly creature. If this comic ever goes anywhere, we've just established the relationship of the cast. The monk wants the cat, but hates the troll and monster cat. The troll wants both the cat and the hell cat and hates the monk. The hell cat wants the monk and hates the troll and the cat he's chasing after due to jealousy. So these are the three characters, four if you count the prized cat. The challenge I found after finishing my walk was, how do I communicate all this in the art? Which brings us to the next segment. Before starting, I made a separate file to undertake this challenge. This is one of those areas where I can confidently say I'm out of my depth. Now, I'm no TB Choi, so the poses you see are stiff. The anatomy is okay, the hands and feet need work, but these shortcomings aren't the focus. The focus is to create designs that don't suffer from same face syndrome, and their bodies aren't overtly, uh, you get it. The first pass lasted two days, trying different clothes and hairstyles till I got something more concrete. Frustrated, I would delete and start again, then just switch to another character and back to the other when things weren't clicking. With their silhouettes, I decided to pin down their mannequins. Then I refined the designs again and again, copying and pasting them to a new lineup, working on the individual character design separately, adding fun sketches or expressions around it. I had reference photos pulled up beside me to help inform my decisions. Again and again, I refined it, until I was done. I settled on the second pass to inform the rest of the cast's design. I made a new character lineup sheet and would reference it heavily throughout my process. It's rough and lacks other perspectives like three-quarter view and side profiles, which means I have to guess what the characters may look like in a different angle on the fly. Tough? Yes. But I know myself well enough to know that I will spend months trying to make the best designs possible. Meanwhile, we only have weeks. Time was creeping after four days and I just said, screw it, future me will deal with it. 
and boy, did future me resent that decision. Looking back on it, the troll was simple to design. I enjoyed drawing him. The female lead was... also good to render. Yes, I know it's a cat hybrid, and no, this isn't a furry thing, please don't judge me. The biggest pain in the ass was the monk, and it reflects in his character sheet. There's hardly anything in it. The reason for this was that I had to avoid the cardinal sin of redrawing the same bland protagonist found in every anime you've ever watched. You know, that young guy with black hair and bangs who may or may not be a shy pervert with too much power to do with. Optimistic and wants to get dummy strong to protect everybody. Not this guy. I decided to give him the ability to grow a beard, a feature I don't see a lot in the media landscape, and sharp facial features once he shaves it off. Obviously, he still looks like a twink due to the nature of the art style I chose, but I tried to make the dark eyes world weary. And based on his getup in both versions of the character, there's a good chance he may not even be a monk. Like, his torn robe is paired with a tight t-shirt he probably found in a donation box. And let's also include long, greasy hair. In summary, think Norman Reedus in The Walking Dead. Pro tip, it's also good to do fan art of your own designs. May help commit the designs to memory. Here's some sketches I did on paper of the monk and Hellcat using the character sheet. From here on out, the next phase was storyboarding. I like using traditional means when it comes to this. Printer paper and mechanical pencil is sufficient enough. On a single 9 by 12 page, draw a series of small boxes and draw the scenes as they pop up in your head. These small boxes will be within a rectangle. The rectangle signifies the page. With the character sheet on a nearby computer monitor and clipboard in my hands, I decided to freely run through the sequence of events using these squares contained within these rectangles. I breezed past this section in only 30 minutes. At the end, I counted the number of pages I would need to make this story, and it came out to 23 pages. To apply, I need 17 pages or less. So I guess we're starting again. I need another pass to get to that 17 mark. Using an 8-panel per page format at this point, the goal is to keep the essential information and omit details that added too many pages, or slowed down the story. I modified the panels from this template wherever I could so the composition wouldn't get repetitive. Certain plot details like the monk using a magic bag to carry his tools, a scene where a monk uses a canary to fend off the troll, or close-ups of what the cat actually looks like in her true form, or her getting dressed in her human form, had to be left out for the sake of brevity. Ultimately, the second pass took only 2 hours and 17 minutes to do, but what you see in this master board is almost one-to-one -to, -one to what you see in the finished product. All of this was done on July 24th, 2023. Four months remain. Now from here, I need to take what I drew from these tiny thumbnails and resize it to a rough sketch on another 9 by 12 size paper. My best tip, squint a lot as you look back and forth between the tiny canvas to bigger canvas. The dates get a bit sporadic from here with page 1 starting on August 8th, and the last page being completed on August 23rd. This was probably because I was busy enjoying the summertime and didn't feel like being cooped up inside solving the riddle of panel design. All it took was one day, and a bit of nostalgia from my own life, to help me power through and finish. When I finally finished, I reserved two days to sit down and scan each page into my laptop later uploading to Clip Studio during the setup phase. With everything labeled and uploaded, I reviewed each page, looking at the areas where I struggled most when it came to sketching and inking. I hit my first snag on page one of all places. The first panel of the page was supposed to set the setting of the story. I wanted a wealthy mansion in the scene, but what I drew was a bit too simple. It didn't exactly communicate an isolated mansion with an enchanted forest for a backyard. This could be anybody's roof. This problem was a head-scratcher. My visual library didn't have a lot of houses in storage, so creating one out of imagination was not going to happen. 
I had two choices, keep it vague in panel one, or take an actual reference to use. The only problem with option two was it couldn't be copyrighted as stipulated by the rules. I would need to take my own photos to reference. I kind of pondered the problem for a few days. At the time I decided to take up skateboarding again and made it a habit to venture to new places. I decided one affluent area would be the perfect spot. I cut through an abandoned trail and found myself at two mansions in the center of the trail. Why it was there, I couldn't tell you. Probably belonging to someone affluent in the past. Now it's empty. It looked haunting and I just stared at it for a moment before pressing on. It then occurred to me after coming back as the sun was going down that this house would be perfect as a reference photo for the comic. I took the photo and then nearly skated into traffic because I don't understand how to stop. Satisfied, I downloaded the photo on my laptop and created the file. Here are the settings I used. The mission here is to reduce as much time sorting through layers. Make it easy to locate, draw, and move to the next one. No opening and downloading reference photos because they'll already be there. Panels, made them beforehand. Is the canvas the right proportion, size, and dimension? Don't fret. It's already done. Here's an example. Create two folders labeled as prepped and not prepped. Color each folder to your liking like green and red. Create another folder and label it page one. Upload your corresponding scanned rough page and place it in page one. Move the folder to the not prepped folder. Continue the process of making page folders and moving them to the not prepped till you get all 17 pages. From there, I start the panel design process. I turn on Snap to Ruler and using the panel tool, I create vector lines to act as borders for the art in each frame. It will create a new folder for each panel. They will be ranked according to creation. So in the layer tab, if you started with panel one, then it will be on the bottom of the order, and the last panel you created will be on the top. To make navigation easier, just reorder them so panel one is on top and last panel below. But that's up to you. Before you start sketching, go into the specific panel folder and create a new layer labeling it appropriately like sketch. Same goes for adding inks and halftones to your pages. This step is meant to avoid the mistake of inking on the wrong layer or getting lost. Adding panels requires some thought and knowledge of composition. If your rough pages have panel shapes that confuse where the eye should go, panel to panel, then at this stage you should really consider redesigning it. Remember, your goal is to make it easy for the reader to read. Once you set up every panel, close the folders and move it from not prepped to prepped. You are now prepared to start the next stage. Quick note here, once a week on a weekend, I completed at least two to four pages at best. By the end of August, I was ready to begin rendering the art. It took me roughly a month to complete the prep stage, bringing the timetable to September. From here, the real fun begins. I'm going to show you some of the footage from the first eight pages in the following time lapses. You may ask, what happened to the footage of the other nine pages? And the answer is, I didn't record them. I also stopped timing myself, so how much time I spent on each page is anyone's guess. Normally I'm a good boy when it comes to accounting, managing every dollar and every penny of time spent on a task. But this time I couldn't do it. If we turn back the clock a little to the beginning of the video, I mentioned the illustration I made in secret. Without the pressure of a countdown, I just drew how I felt. If it was tricky, i put the stylus down and try again later, excited to finish. But as soon as I returned to my usual workflow, I couldn't do it. I was scared to even start this project. It dragged my feet whenever I saw my calendar, Comic Today, posted on the day of. If I didn't sit down at my desk, I'd go out and do something else with my day. When I did start, I found myself struggling to stay motivated with a big fat stopwatch near my head. And OBS wasn't helping. I was becoming increasingly paranoid. 
questioning my competency. For example, I felt like page one sucked and went over it, redrew it, worked on other pages, and then came back and redrew it again. I kept picking at it and wasting time. So after page eight, I stopped recording. I deleted the time last recording and replaced the timer with a clock and calendar. The latter still gave me a visual of what was on the line. It also served as a passive aggressive threat to keep working. What you are watching here is how I tackled drawing a manga. Truth be told, I was still drawing it like I would an American comic, using simplified cartooning here and there for comedic purposes. But as we approach page 17, the art improved drastically. If you haven't noticed already, I started by drawing a mannequin of each character in each frame. At first, I had just dived into inking, but that led to the art being a bit cartoony in page one. In that instance, it wasn't intentional. Moving forward, I decided to rethink my strategy. Using mannequins was the next logical step. So when in doubt, give your characters proper bones. Next up, I lowered the opacity of the original rough. Then I started a refined sketch of each frame, making what was once vague more concrete. Once you finish, turn off the original rough and see your comic page before it inks. Technically, this would be called penciling in American comics. From there, we move on to inking. The great part of the vector border is that no matter what, the lines will stay inside the panel. Even if you overshoot a line, it still exists out of frame. This is handy when it comes to the finishing stage. After inking one panel, it's simply rinse and repeat for every panel and on every page. Now, to avoid staleness, here's a quick animatic of the story I made. Our tale begins when our silent monk is summoned by a wealthy cat lady to her mansion. The client, in between sobs, recounts the events of the previous night. Alerted to a sound coming from her favorite cat's bedroom, she would open the door to find her child being kidnapped by a troll. She was helpless to stop it and watched as it fled into the dark woods. The monk, seemingly disinterested, becomes a bit annoyed by the cat on his lap. He changes his tune when he sees the reward, a briefcase of unmarked bills. But before he could get his dirty hands on it, she presented him with his mission. Get her precious back, or no money. So embarking further into the enchanted forest, he eventually comes across the troll's cave. Inside, he's surprised to find the troll's lair is rather well furnished. Beyond the decor, he finds cages full of unhappy cats begging for help. He spots the troll behind a curtain. Evidently, the missing cat is enjoying the troll's company. She even voluntarily goes inside its special cage. With the use of a remote, the troll locks the cat inside. The monk observes him placing the remote on a nearby table. He stealthily enters the room while the troll is distracted. The troll was just observing his most prized possession in a much larger cage with scattered bones around it. The creature inside was not at all amused. Just as the monk got the remote and was about to rescue his client's cat, he made one fatal mistake. He forgot to practice good hygiene, and the troll became alerted to his bad B.O. Unsheathing his cane sword, he cut off the monk's beard. Had the monk not tripped and fell, the troll would have cut off more than a single hair with the second blow. Fearful, he accidentally presses the button on the remote, opening all of the cages. The captive cats surround and attack the troll, sending him over the edge, falling off the cliff into the darkness below. No cat was harmed in this scene, by the way. Returning to his prize, he finds that the cat is long gone. He's not too pleased. Leaving the cave, he decides it's time for a bath. Unbeknownst to him, he also released the monstrous creature in the giant cage from earlier. She shrinks down and tracks her next potential meal. Upon discovering the monk in the river, she selects him as her prey. After a shave, he turns out to be more than just a snack and decides not to eat him. Before he can cut his locks and be a proper monk, she steals his scissors as well as his soap and clean clothes to freshen up. He wasn't aware of this, but upon returning to shore, he's beside himself in quiet rage. Later, he sets up camp and somberly reflects under the stars. 
resigning himself to sleep, the creature sneaks up on him, revealing herself to be a cat lady, an attractive cat lady. I said, don't judge me. She tries to steal a kiss from her Prince Charming, but misses and reconsiders whether or not she wants to eat him. Turning him over on his back, she sticks to her original thought. I mean, how could you with that face? Instead, she decides to sleep beside him, listening to his heartbeat as she fell asleep, happy. So happy, she eventually went into a deep sleep and started drooling on him. All is well with the world. Except for the fact that the monk is awake, filled with terror. Much like James Franco in that one movie, he's trapped between a rock and a hard place. And you can't exactly chop off your torso to escape in this situation, so that option is out. He tries in vain to reach for his bag and staff without waking the slumbering beast, digging her claws into his skin. It's here that a familiar face shows up. The precious cat. His excitement disappears when he realizes the real reason the cat showed up is to kick dirt into his face and run away, laughing at him. His hatred for cats after this incident is fully actualized. Truly over it, he gives up. The story concludes with the hellcat smiling to herself while the troll rises from his burial and the cat ventures further into the enchanted forest. Is this quality novella material? I don't know. And I don't care. I know one thing. I am tired and we need to move on. If you didn't notice by now, I really don't trust myself. There are too many instances where things got deleted and I was beside myself. So I made two files of the same thing. One file has all my original work and the other is a copy. The only difference between the two is the copy has the two page spread option selected. I was also sure to check off the binding point with the option left binding checked off. So when I pasted the pages in to the second file, it would read from left to right. And seeing as it's 17 pages, I made the second file total 18 instead of 17. The reason being, most printing presses only recognize even numbers. And if you try to put 17 pages, Clip Studio will give you an error screen to prevent you from making that mistake. Stupid, I know. Again, I can't stress enough, you don't have to do this. One Clip Studio file is more than enough. I just wanted to cover all bases and reduce any chance of failure. Not that it hasn't stopped me before, but, you know, a guy has to take precautions. But anyway, if you've properly laid out the comic pages in the thumbnail or storyboard phase and properly labeled your subsequent JPEG files, you're good to go. You're in the clear. That said, let me show you something I don't see a lot in art videos on YouTube. The finishing stage and the boring stuff. Feel free to skip to the aftermath section if the boring stuff offends your eyeballs. For the rest of you who suffer from anxiety and the fear that you may have missed something, here's what to look out for. Not much to say in terms of finishing. The best practice is to review each page in the order it would appear in publication. Add the half tones where you see fit in a new layer for every page. Note on a separate piece of paper where there are inconsistencies in the art and how to edit them after you're done reviewing. One example is on page 12. The monk is in new attire, but the sleeve is on a different arm. This error was probably caused when I flipped the image while I was inking and didn't flip it back. Oh boy. In most cases, you must consider this question. Is there enough time? Can I let this mistake go or will it take the reader out of the story? I decided to let it go. I rationalized that the monk turned his robe inside out and the robe was originally white. He was that dirty. Thus, I left the color alone and made sure all the variations thereafter were consistent with this decision. So no halftones were added. 
After editing the chosen pages and resizing them on the second file, I finished page 17 on November 30th at 6 p.m. I submitted my work the following day on December 1st at 10.32 p.m., thus completing the challenge. I could effectively end the video here, but that's what most art challenges do. They ignore the boring stuff, aka exporting. Let me paint you an in-depth picture here. You create the most sophisticated art that could bring tears to the greatest masters. If you fail to read the instructions on the contest website, doesn't matter if you created a work of absolute beauty, you are automatically out of the contest, sending countless hours of work down into the void. For those of you who decided to stick around for this segment, here are the details I almost failed to read. Page one is a loner. Technically, it's called the cover page outside if you're using Clip Studio EX, or just the cover page. This could affect how your story is told. If you put a big reveal before a page turn, you ruin the story momentum or the big surprise. Be aware of this and use it to your advantage when presenting your story. Label each JPEG or PNG page underscore zero number. If it's a single number like the first page, label it as page underscore zero one. If it's a double digit number like 11, eliminate the zero and label it as page underscore one one. If it helps, save all the files on your desktop or create a file on said desktop to save them too. More on that in a second. The file size on every single JPEG file must be 2 megabytes or less. To check if you meet the 2 megabyte limit, right click the JPEG you created and click on Get Info. Then look at the size. If it's more than 2, that means you have to go back and change the resolution of the page before exporting. Export it and check again. Do this until you get to 2 megabytes or less. Editor note here. Yes, the rules did say you need 300 dpi, but if the page is still legible even at 250 dpi and also meets the 2 megabyte limit, I say some rules need to be broken. But that's up to you. And if that's the option you want to do, well, Here's how to do it. Go back to Clip Studio, go to Edit, hit Export Single Page, and select JPEG. Label it and save it to your desktop. And suddenly, a confusing pop-up will appear in Clip Studio. Remember this, it is your friend. With the pop-up open, look at the heading JPEG settings and change quality from 100 to 70 as a precaution. Then look down until you see the header output size and you'll see the resolution grayed out. Click on it and it will become active. From here, change the resolution. In my case, I had it set to 600, so I lowered it to 250. Then go way down and under process when scaling, select for comic and then change the rasterize to prefer quality. Hit export and see if it did anything. Repeat this process by changing the resolution only until you meet the limit for all pages. If you guys have a better way to go about this process, please let us know in the comments and we'll take it from there. Okay, with all your JPEGs labeled and meeting the size requirement, put them into a new folder on your desktop. Label it Contest JPEG or however you may like. You can mark it down as Death Upon Touching or something. This process will save you from breaking your keyboard in about a minute. Because, lastly, when you create your creator profile and create a new entry, click the static image in question one and fill out the page, blah blah blah, you'll scroll down to the bottom with the uploading section. This is the most important part. Do not try to select file to download. The instructions on the website will tell you it does not work. I tried it. It does not work. I didn't believe them and nearly went ape when I kept getting an error for 30 minutes. 
Instead, resize your browser till it's smaller, then open the file on your desktop labeled Contest JPEG and proceed to drag and drop to the gray square. It should work. You'll see all your pages populate on the website. Make sure they are in order. Then hit submit and you are done. After completing your manga submission, it will show up as an entry on your dashboard. You can even view it at your own leisure, but it doesn't become available for the public to see until after the judging is complete in February. In the meantime, I'd recommend you sit back and slowly slide to the floor, becoming a human puddle. Following my escapade, I decided to stop drawing for a while and enjoy the last months of the year, which prompted me to go on another walk. To figure out this script, mostly. What lessons did I learn from this? Don't do this unless you want to prove something to yourself, or you want to make content for your viewers' amusement. As a draftsman, I have a long way to go. Hands, feet, hair, drapery, and value need work. Overall, I'm proud I did it. It's something my younger self dreamed of doing but lacked the skill and the guts to do. This is one more thing checked off my bucket list. I'll eventually post this comic at some point next year on the webcomic app Tapas. You can find a title that has Lucky Kitty. Not very original, I know, but I was running on fumes when I made the final submission. I'll announce its publication via Instagram or YouTube in the near future. Till then, I shall slumber for another few months till I resurface as suddenly as Freddy Cougar in your bathtub. Thanks for watching, and don't give up.